Stanford University. Good evening, and welcome to the Roger W. Hines Lecture for 2013 on behalf of the Stanford Office for Religious Life. I'm Scotty McLennan, the Dean for Religious Life. And in the mid-1990s, the James Irvine Foundation established the Heinz Lectures on Religion and Community. The series brings to the Stanford campus leading thinkers who examine the intersection of systems of belief and practice with human groups and societies. Recent Heinz lectures have included the Dalai Lama, Karen Armstrong, Bart Ehrman, Amy Jill Levine, Ibu Patel, Jim Wallace, Bishop Catherine Jefford Shorey, and Anna Devere Smith. And we're thrilled and honored that Krista Tippett will be this year's Heinz lecturer. There's much to honor in Roger Heinz and his legacy. A professor of psychology, and then dean, and then vice president at the University of Michigan. He came to the University of California at Berkeley, where he served as chancellor from 1965 to 1971. Heinz led the American Council on Education, and then the Hewlett Foundation until his retirement in 1992. For many years, he lent his energy and wisdom to Stanford. Having become a regular participant at its memorial church and a consultant to university leaders. We're delighted to honor him again this year with tonight's lecture. And I'm grateful to religious studies professor emeritus Robert Gregg, formerly the Dean for Religious Life, who worked closely with the Irvine Foundation to establish this lecture series. I also want to to recognize for the primary work logistically and organizing uh, and producing tonight's event from uh, Nasan Cho from the Office for Religious Life. In a moment, I'm going to welcome my colleague, Associate Dean for Religious Life, Joanne Sanders, to introduce tonight's speaker. And at the end of the evening, Senior Associate Dean for Religious Life, Patricia Carlin Newman, will end our evening. And now, can I welcome Joanne Sanders to the podium. Good evening, everyone. It is a great privilege to have the honor of introducing our esteemed guest to you this evening. Peabody award-winning broadcaster Krista Tippett grew up in Oklahoma, attended Brown University, and spent most of the 1980s in divided Germany. She was the New York Times stringer in Berlin, and I'm going to have to ask Krista what a stringer is. I'm a former tennis coach, and stringer has a different meaning for me. <laughs> Um, and also reported for Newsweek, the International Herald Tribune, the BBC, and Die Zeit. Later, she served as a special political assistant and chief Berlin aide to the US ambassador to West Germany. She wrote her first book, Speaking of Faith, in part to answer the question she is often asked, how she went from that mode of geopolitical engagement to becoming a religious person and student of theology. When she emerged from Yale with a Master of Divinity in 1994, Krista saw a black hole where intelligent journalistic coverage of religion should be. She began to imagine radio conversations about the spiritual and intellectual content of faith that would enliven and open imaginations and public discussion. She says, it's always been very important to me to enlarge imaginations about how this part of life we call religious and spiritual actually works in real far-flung 21st century lives. On Being with Krista Tippett, formerly called Speaking of Faith, is Public Radio's weekly program about religion, meaning, ethics, and ideas. 
The show is produced and distributed by American Public Media and is currently heard on over 200 public radio stations across the United States and globally via the web and podcast. With speaking of faith and its newest incarnation on being, Krista Tippett has inspired a new mode of intelligent, in-depth discussion about faith, ethics, religion, and meaning in everyday life. She says, we aspire to create hours of radio that are beautiful, intelligent, nourishing, edifying, trustworthy, quiet, and hospitable. They are also challenging, but not in a way that puts people on the defensive or invites posturing. We invite listeners and give them tools to open their minds, to see differently, and to start new conversations within themselves. Her latest initiative, The Civil Conversations Project, is a series of radio shows and online tools for healing our fractured civic spaces. In conversation with Krista Tippett, guests like Terry Tempest Williams and Vincent Harding ask, how can we bridge the gulf between us caused by disagreements around politics and morality? I think all of us would agree these are certainly timely questions and considerations offering all of us an invitation to honest and respectful dialogue. Many do agree that Krista Tippett is indeed the measured, balanced voice we need and is a trustworthy guide to the challenges of religion and faith in a dangerous, complex world. Please join me this evening in warmly welcoming to Stanford and our community a true original and authentic author, radio show host and journalist, Krista Tippett. Thanks to Reverend Sanders for that lovely introduction, and uh, I'm so happy to be here. This, this has been on my calendar for a long time. I remember meeting various constellations of the three of you, Rabbi Carlin Newman and Scotty McClellan, uh, in other places around the globe, and here we are. And I can't believe that I'm talking about civility tonight, this week. <laughs> Um, I do want to say, I, I, we're going to have lots of time afterwards for a, a conversation here uh, with whatever's on your mind, and I look forward to that. I'm happier in a conversation than in delivering a monologue. Um, so I put the word adventure before civility months ago when we came up with the title of this speech. Um, because I, I do worry that the word civility has connotations that I don't intend of niceness, tameness and safety. Little did I know that uh, I would arrive here and we would be in the midst of a bruising week of government shutdown and that civility in the realm of politics would seem like an impossible dream and far too small to, to resolve things. But that I'm not here to talk about political life. I'm here to talk about public life and that is bigger than politics. Though we have narrowly equated these two in recent years, and I think we have impoverished ourselves as a result. So I want to start by pulling back and taking a long view of our moment in history. We are turn of century people. And this terrifying and wondrous century that we have entered is opening, throwing open basic questions that the 20th century thought it had answered. Questions that are intimate and civilizational all at once. Definitions of life and death, of the meaning of marriage and family, of human relationship to the natural world, of human relationship to technology. We are reimagining the very nature of authority, of leadership, of community, fundamentally reconsidering how we structure our lives together. We are in the midst of nothing less than a reformation of all of our institutions, 
And that includes politics and education and economics and religion. And the interesting and challenging thing about this moment is that we know the old forms don't work anymore, but we can't yet see the new forms that will take their place. We are making them up in real time. Now, all of this drives us back to grapple anew with core human questions, questions that have animated philosophy and religion across the ages. Why are we here? What does it mean to be human? What matters in a life? What are we to each other? We are undertaking this grappling also at the same time with a proximity and interdependence with different others that is unprecedented in human history. For us, the question of what it means to be human has become inextricable from the question of who we are to each other. This magnitude of change is deeply unsettling for human beings. Physiologically, science is showing us this. Now, I am aware that here at Stanford, I'm at an epicenter of entrepreneurial vigor. And natural entrepreneurs are actually invigorated by the stress that comes with uncertainty and change. But for most human beings, and I think for all of us, some of the time, change and uncertainty generate anxiety and fear. They do. And fear sends a lot of people sheltering behind their barricades. It shuts imaginations down rather than opening them up. It is no wonder that cohesive public life has become something daring, a frontier to settle, not territory we can easily recall or imagine getting back to. So we started what we eventually began to call the Civil Conversations Project in the election season of 2010. We've kind of gotten used to this now, but it, you know, election seasons are traumatizing times. Um, and then this project intensified a few months later in early 2011 after the shooting of Gabrielle Giffords in Tucson. Those days and weeks before Tucson were another political period in which divisive cultural rhetoric had just reached toxic levels. And suddenly, for a brief moment after those events, uh, beautiful speeches were given, and this new vocabulary entered our public life. The language calls for moral imagination and social healing and civil discourse. Those longings never went away, but they were also never really met. And what I saw is that while so many of us, including our politicians, resonated with those calls, we had no idea how to make them real. We could not point to where visibly in our public life those qualities are robustly modeled. We must discover for our time what moral imagination or social healing or civil discourse can look like in the public sphere. What do they sound like? What makes them possible? Where can we see them embodied? Who will be their leaders? Recently, actually, as I was formulating what I wanted to say to you tonight, I heard a legal scholar give a definition of politician as a, con a conversational entrepreneur. <laughs> Someone who shapes, creates, and launches public discourse. I, I have to say, I don't see many conversational entrepreneurs in our current political class. But I do believe, and this gave me some good language to something I believe passionately, that we are all called to be conversational entrepreneurs at this moment in time, to immediately begin to create the spaces for taking up the great hard questions of our time with different others, to start those conversations we want to hear, to discover how to calm fear and plant the seeds for robust civil society, for that robust civil society that we desire and that our age demands. And these callings are too important and too life-giving to wait for politics at its most strident to change. 
This is civic work and it is human spiritual work in the most expansive 21st sense of that word. We all have it in ourselves to be nourishers of discernment, forces of healing. So this evening, for the next few moments, I want to offer you what I'm calling a few encouragements in that direction that I'm going to draw from my life of conversation. My first encouragement is that words matter. And that may seem like a kind of obvious statement to make in a room full of students and teachers uh, and scholars. I make it as a journalist. The words we use shape how we understand ourselves, how we move through the world, how we treat others. And the world right now needs the most vivid, transformative universe of words that you and I can muster. The latter part of the last century was driven by vocabularies of technological advance and social progress that aspired to order our common life by way of ideologies, data, and facts. And when this country first began to experience genuine diversity in the 1960s, genuine diversity ethnically, racially, religiously, for, the, for really the first time, um, we pursued the reasonable order that would be achieved by a civic mandate of tolerance. That's the word we chose. Tolerance was the primary civic virtue by which we would navigate this new difference. And that word itself was always problematic. Tolerance connotes allowing, enduring, and indulging. In the medical context, which is where it comes from, it's about the limits of thriving in an unfavorable environment. Tolerance is not a lived virtue. It's a kind of cerebral ascent. And it is too cerebral to animate guts and hearts and thus behavior when the going gets rough. And the going has gotten pretty rough. I am not saying that tolerance doesn't have value. It does. It was probably the right place to start, but it's not big enough for where we need to go next. And I don't think it was ever big enough from a human and spiritual perspective. Tolerance does not ask us to care for the stranger. It doesn't even invite us to know each other, to listen, to be curious, to be open to being moved and surprised by each other. The week of Tucson, of the week of the Tucson shootings back in 2011, as that all unfolded, we'd already put our program to be broadcast up on the satellite. And it was a conversation with a poet, with Elizabeth Alexander, the poet who delivered the, poet, uh, the poem at the first Obama inauguration. And you know, we were concerned about this, uh, putting a poet on the air seeming pretty irrelevant in a week of national tragedy. That podcast went through the roof. Elizabeth Alexander, in that week, talked about how we are starved for fresh language to approach each other. That we crave, and she said she saw this in her children as much as herself, we crave words that shimmer, individual words with power, words to convey real truth, which is something different from conveying facts. I think we've hit the limits of our collective belief in facts to tell us the whole story or even necessarily to tell us the truth. Elizabeth Alexander said, we need imagination and spirit to glean meaning in the midst of our quotidian difficulties and rise above them. And that that is one of the reasons that poetry, her milieu, is magnetic. Poetry, she said, gets at undergirding truths at the essence of the world and ourselves. Our spiritual and religious traditions have always known this. You know, naming is one of the original, fundamental, creative acts in almost every sacred tradition I know of. And the Bible and other sacred texts masterfully use all kinds of language, including lots of poetry, 
to convey the canvas of truth about life that facts alone cannot convey, to deal in words that shimmer and enliven and heal. The other thing about the language in those texts is they've also always worked with words that have practices attached, practices that go where tolerance never could, compassion, kindness, mercy, mindful attention, practical love, love of neighbor, love of enemy. Here are some lines from a poem of Elizabeth Alexander. Poetry is what you find in the dirt in the corner, over here on the bus, God in the details, the only way to get from here to there. Poetry, and now my voice is rising, is not all love, 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 and I'm sorry the dog died. <laughs> Poetry, here I hear mes myself loudest, is the human voice. And are we not of interest to each other? Are we not of interest to each other? You know, what if we just planted that question in the middle of our common life, in the halls of Congress, and just let it sit there and let it echo? And that gets to my second encouragement, which is to rediscover questions, questions as spiritual virtues and civic tools. In American civic life, we mostly trade in answers. We trade in competing answers. Or we trade in questions, which aren't really questions at all, but tools or weapons that are meant to corner and catch and incite, or at the very least, to be entertaining. In that ever-present spectacle, there's a truth that I invite you to really notice and ponder, and that is what a powerful thing a question is. Questions, I have learned, elicit answers in their likeness. I remember uh, a few years ago, I was at an event that the Lilly Endowment was hosting. It was about the future of Christianity and the fact that like every institution, the forms make no sense, and what will this be? And I was sitting around just listening to a lot of really wise people agonize about something that meant a great deal to them. And there was a man I was very impressed with, and he talked about how he felt, one thing he said is, I'm amazed at the discussions people aren't having. And that's a good general statement. And he said that he was aware that where things went wrong, they started with the wrong question. And he said, a wrong question leads to a wrong answer, what do you say, which leads to a simplistic conclusion, which leads to a meaningless argument. And, and what a depiction of a dynamic that we've all seen so many times, and we've just seen it unfold again this week, right, in our public life. Now, I've, I'm also aware, I've talked about this in educational settings, and I and I know also in my own education, to say that there's such a thing as a wrong question raises some alarm bells. And so I ha I've had to think about that. And you know, what I'm not saying is that a sim you know, sometimes a simple question is absolutely what's needed to bring clarity. So this isn't about simplicity, but it is about intentionality. It's about being mindful of the intentionality behind our questions. And again, that power, a simplistic question, uh, draws forth a simplistic answer. It's very hard to transcend when you are asked a simplistic question. An inflammatory question elicits an inflammatory answer. But I can also state this positively, it's hard to resist and not to rise to a generous question. We can formulate questions that draw forth honesty and dignity and revelation in the best sense of that word. There is something redemptive and life-giving about asking a better question. And I have also learned that even with the most intractable issues, the issues that we rehash in our public life over and over again, and we're convinced that they can only end in a fight, that is, it is actually possible to start those with a different question 
and not trod the same old ground and not end up in the same dead-end place. You know, are you pro-life or pro-choice? This is the, these are the framing questions. Are you for guns or against guns? Uh, are you pro-gay marriage or anti-gay marriage? We can start discussions aimed at the adventure of exploring what is at stake for all of us in human terms. One of the wonderful conversation partners that I've gotten to know through the Civil Conversations Project is Frances Kissling. And if you know her name, you probably know her name because she was the longtime head of Catholics for Choice. She was a very well-known uh, pro-choice activist. What's less highly publicized about Frances Kissling is that when she retired from Catholics for Choice about five years ago, she decided to embark on a new adventure of exploring what it would mean to be in real relationship with her political opposites. And that's what she has devoted herself to these last years. And she's a fascinating person to talk to. And you know, a lot of the things she's learned have been uncomfortable, and she's still learning them. Like she talks about, she's learned about the necessity of developing the courage to be vulnerable in front of those with whom you passionately disagree. That's a long road to walk. And then this past fall, as part of the Civil Conversations Project, I brought together Francis and David Gushy, who's a wonderful uh, theologian uh, from Mercer University in Georgia. And he's on the pro-life side of the spectrum, but that's really to diminish him, to put it that way. And so what we, what we tried, what we did is we had a discussion about abortion, which was not framed by the categories of pro-life and pro-choice. We actually tried not to use that language, and we almost succeeded. And you know, we had a discussion that was big and messy and provocative in such an interesting way. Um, you know, what I want to stress is that taking that language out of it doesn't make it easy or simple. It, it actually reintroduces complexity and the hardness. I mean, we ended up talking about things like whether the sexual revolution was good for any of us and how we might rehumanize and deepen uh, our relationship to sexuality in public as well as private spheres. You know, this was big, unsettling, thrilling stuff, but it was all new. It was all fresh. So I want to stress that, you know, the conversations I'm proposing also are not about leaping to common ground. That's not the point of this. They're not about the move tolerance often made, which comes under the rubric of celebrating diversity, which has meant kind of putting diversity up on a pedestal and not engaging uh, its messiness or its depths. This, what I'm aspiring to, is about engaging difference with humility and vulnerability and creating new possibilities for moving forward while being different and while even probably continuing to hold passionate disagreement. It's about how we can live together. Here's something Frances Kissling says. She's not a big believer in common ground either. She said, I think that common ground can be found between people who do not have deep, deep differences. And in politics, you can find compromise, although I think that's up in question right now. Politics is the art of the possible. But to think that you are going to take the National Conference of Catholic Bishops and the National Organization of Women, and they are going to find common ground on abortion is not practical. It's not going to happen. And we could extend that. But she says, I do think that when, pe that when people who disagree with each other come together with a, goal of, with a goal of gaining a better understanding of why the other believes what they do, good things come of that. But the pressure of coming to agreement works against really understanding each other. That's a provocative thought. And we don't understand each other. In my work, I have been 
very deeply formed by some words of the poet Rilke on living the questions, holding questions. He, he wrote that we should love the questions themselves as if they were locked rooms or books written in a very foreign language. Don't search for the answers which could not be given to you now because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps then someday far in the future, you will gradually, without even noticing it, live your way into the answer. These intimate civilizational questions we are revisiting as a culture are not going to be resolved anytime soon with answers we can all agree on. But surely we can agree that we want to live our way into the answers together. Which flows into my third encouragement, to honor the difficulty of what we face, the complexity of what it means to be human, to be realistic about how badly we've done this in recent times and that we are beginners again, to start small, to realize, for example, the critical importance of creating safe spaces before anything profound can happen. Back to that fear place that our non-entrepreneurial brains send us to in the face of uncertainty and change. We can't ask people to become vulnerable in front of those with whom they passionately disagree unless we can make them safe first. And in this, I am comforted and buoyed by a conversation I had with a very erudite philosopher, Kwame Anthony Appiah. He has an amazing personal story. Uh, he's British and Ghanaian, and now he's American. And his parents' marriage in the 1950s uh, of an Afri his African father and his uh, high-born British mother was one of the love stories that gave rise to the movie Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. So he actually lived through one of these moments of social change, of moral change, because Remember, in that time, you know, interracial marriage was seen as a moral issue, uh, morally repugnant by many people. And that was something that, you know, within a generation, uh, people would look back on that and say, what were we thinking? How could we have lived that way? I, I find the memory that, that we make those turns in human society very comforting at a moment like this where it's really impossible to see how we'll find our way out of this dysfunction. And then Anthony Appy has gone on to study in many societies across time and geography how these kinds of pivotal moral social turning points happen, how foot binding ended in China, how slavery ended as a fundament of the British Empire, uh, how dueling ended as a way for honorable gentlemen to resolve disputes. And what he found in all of these cases is that for a long time, there were people in those, in those cultures who knew this was crazy, right? Um, and, but so gradually, so, but so change took place over time, across time, in the human heart. And then at some point where that has built they wouldn't have used the term critical mass in China in the era of foot binding. Mean, what you would get to then, then the movements come along and they uproot the structure and the change happens. Um, but again, what's comforting about what he found is that is that change comes about quietly uh, by way of what he calls conversation, but in the old-fashioned sense, and that is conversation defined as simple association, habits of coexistence, seeking familiarity amount around mundane human qualities of who we are. So we called the show that we created with him sidling up to difference. That's a phrase he uses. Difference is something you can sidle up to. He does say that when you turn a dispute over to legislation, it becomes something of a conversation stopper. 
And you know, that is one thing that we, that we reach for very quickly in this culture, not only in our political life, but in our religious institutions and all of our institutions. Let's make a law and get this over. So, Anthony Appiah says, the way to set moral change in motion is not to go for the jugular or even in the first instance to go, instance to go for dialogue not to go straight for the things that divide you. He says, it's all right to talk about sports and talk about the weather and talk about your children to make a human connection. And then he says, down the way, if you have that background of relationship between individuals and communities that is in that sense conversational, then when you have to talk about the things that do divide you, you have a platform. You can begin with the assumption that you like and respect each other, even though you don't agree about everything. And we also all have a lot of those people in our own families, by the way. So we know that it's possible to navigate this and stay in relationship with people. Um, and that maybe you can build on that. And you can know that at the end of the conversation, it's quite likely that you'll both think something pretty close to what you both thought at the start. But you might at least have a deeper appreciation for the other person's point of view. And that turns out to make it easier to accept the outcome, what, whether it's the outcome you favor or the outcome the other person favors. And there's actually some really interesting science about that now, that when people feel that they have been heard, when we feel that we have been heard, we can also find it easier to accept something being resolved in the way not that's not in the way we hope to. We can make peace with that and live with that. What Anthony Appiah calls conversation almost necessarily involves another virtue, and that is hospitality. And as virtues go, I really like this one. It's also a very small, reasonable place to start. You know, we talk about aspiring to compassion and love and reconciliation and forgiveness. Those are complex experiences that take a lot of investment and a lot of time. But hospitality, you don't have to love someone to show hospitality. You don't have to agree with them. You don't even have to like them. And yet you can be gracious in that same moment. So I say, when in doubt, practice hospitality. But then give that, give that practice all the sophistication and complexity that it has in life when you offer it to your best friends, right? It's not just the issuing of an invitation. It's the preparation of a meal. It's lighting candles. It's, it's an atmosphere. It's knowing what conversations you're going to push and which ones you will leave for another time. I, uh, I love an image of the Quaker author, Parker Palmer, who some of you may know, that uh, he talks about how in this culture we're very skilled at bringing our intellect into public spaces and public events. We, we know how to wield our opinions. And we've actually gotten very good in this culture in recent generations at bringing our emotions into public spaces. Um, but to invite the insights of the soul, this deep spiritual human part of us, is something different. And Parker likens the soul to a, a wild animal in the backwoods of our psyche. And if it's cross-examined, it will just run away. And he says that for the insights of the soul to speak its truth, we have to create quiet, inviting, and trustworthy spaces. And that's really been a guide for me. Every time I start one of my radio interviews, I try to create a quiet, inviting, and trustworthy space. And that makes all the difference in terms of what follows. That precedes the words, uh, but it opens possibilities. And you know, quiet, inviting, and trustworthy spaces are strangely rare in our world. So what a gift if the conversational entrepreneurs among us could begin to plant these and let them grow. So again, we have 
the language, the tools, the virtues, and the calling as human beings to create hospitable spaces, to convene and curate the new forms of encounter our world is giving birth to, to teach and model these new forms into vitality. We talk a lot about the downside of technology and our relationships, and this is certainly a huge thing we have to deal with, but one upside of technology in this context is that we have these manifold tools that can amplify what happens in our smallest, most local spaces in these small, yeasty environments and send that out virally into the world. And I want to tell you, and we can talk some more about this in a minute if you want, there's so much good news on this front. There are so many amazing initiatives of people taking up this good work in local spaces and in national spaces. And it's all happening, as we say, below the radar. The radar is broken. <laughs> Don't trust it. And my final encouragement to you follows on that that insistence, that observation. And I, I draw it from this beautiful biblical injunction to develop eyes to see and ears to hear. I think that developing eyes to see and ears to hear is a critical uh, spiritual discipline for the 21st century. You know, so much information is coming to us from so many different directions, and what is failing drives the news, which is what a spotlight is shown on. So develop eyes to see and ears to hear. And this is not just about seeing what is new. It's also about becoming attentive to the wisdom of elders in our midst, to people who have lived how social change happens starting below the radar. Absolutely, some of my most treasured conversations are with people who are in their 80s. And as part of the Civil Conversations Project, some of the most important conversations I've had have been with elders, and I want to just close tonight with uh, Vincent Harding, who is a civil rights veteran. Um, he ran the Mennonite House in Atlanta, which was one of the hubs of nonviolence, philosophy and practice. He wrote speeches for Martin Luther King Jr. And he spent these last decades after the heyday of that movement, bringing the lessons of that movement to young people in this country. And Vincent Harding reminds us that Martin Luther King Jr. was a preacher first and a theologian before he was a political figure, and that the civil rights movement was not merely about political rights. It was about creating the beloved community. And it was always about that from beginning to end. The civil rights movement used vivid language and asked world-changing questions. I also was very struck a few years ago, I spoke with another elder, uh, Walter Brueggemann, who's a, an Old Testament professor, and he's one of, the great, uh, one of the great scholars of the prophetic tradition of prophets. And he pointed out to me, you know, he said prophets often use poetic language, and that's how they transcend the you know, the, 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 the forms of speech that get us, that, that devolve into argument. He said, think about the most famous political line of King. You know, the one line we'd all remember, I have a dream. That's a line of poetry. And here's what Vincent Harding, so I was talking to Vincent Harding about what wisdom can you impart from the life you've lived, from this vast social change that you took part in, for us at this moment in our civic life, in our political life, in our democracy, and, and this is what he said. For me, the question of democracy also opens up the question of what does it mean to be truly human. Democracy is simply another way of speaking about that question. Religion is another way of speaking about that question. 
What is our purpose in this world? And is that purpose related to our responsibilities to each other and to the world itself? All of that seems to me to be a variety of languages getting at the same reality. And it seems to me that we need again to recognize that to develop the best humanity, the best spirit, the best community, there needs to be discipline, practices of exploring. How do you do that? How do we work together? How do we talk together in ways that will open up our best capacities and our best gifts? That's a different way to talk about what civil conversation is about. And then he finished by saying, my own feeling, as I try to share again and again, is that when it comes to creating a multiracial, multiethnic, multireligious, democratic society, we are still a developing nation. We've only been thinking about this for about half a century. But my own deep, deep conviction is that the knowledge, like all knowledge, is available to us if we seek it. I find this a wonderfully nourishing message to take in in a week of narrowly averted political catastrophe, to remember that we are in the midst of a long-term project. And I also find this a wonderful message for the young among us, because we spend a lot of time bringing home to them that, that the generations that preceded them have lot, left a lot of messes for them to fix. But this, too, is their calling in all of ours to grow up this democracy to its full political as well as its full human and spiritual potential. May you develop eyes to see and ears to hear this as the adventure it is and dare to make it real in ways that none of us can yet imagine. That's me. Is there some water here? I don't. I don't that's okay. Anyway, so now we can talk about that or anything else you'd like to discuss. Are we doing? Oh, oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. There's a mic coming around. So you've you've provided a lot of encouragements in many different areas, but let me begin with two areas, encouraging discourse in the public and the social sphere and asking questions. What specific vehicles can you recommend to instigate um, the type of discourse that you referenced in your talk? And what sources can provide us a source for emulation of asking the right questions. Um, so g given, given the current state of things, yeah. where do we begin? Um, what did you, what, what, the initially did you say what views? No, I, what I said was that based on, based on what you've provided us with encouragement, yes. um, you want something a little more meaty to start with. Well, you know, I, I think one has to be inspired. And, and listening to you, I am inspired. But leaving this hall, mm -hmm. I'm still not sure where I begin. Certainly right. with my circle of friends, my associates, on an individual basis, I can begin to do that. Um, but we, we are talking about not challenges of just our local community, but also national and international yes. uh, challenges that we face. And we know that the United States is in a position to be a source of emulation for many other parts of the world as it is in so many different fronts. Yeah. So I'm really looking to you to recommend some specific things that I can walk away with and know that it has the ability to multiply. Okay. Um. Well, I have a few, a few different responses. Um, one is that, uh, you know, there's this, 
this pivotal like piece of moral and this story and Ju there's this notion in Judaism this essential moral imperative to repair the world and I I uh, I've been very comforted in in you know a reading of that that that's um, you know we're called to repair the part of the world that we can see and touch and I think I think that's where we have to start and I think one way we get discouraged is you're right I mean the the problems are local, the problems are national, the problems are global. Um, but I, I, I think that sometimes when we, when we see too much of the problem, that that becomes an, an impediment to beginning where we can. Um, you know, just start trying to heal the part of the world you can see and touch. That's the calling. Um, I can talk about some questions, some particular questions, that, and ways of starting a conversation that are useful to me. Um, I started to imagine that you could have a different kind, that you could bring religious voice, draw religious voices out in a way that was completely different than anything we heard in media through uh, some experiences I had at a Benedictine Abbey in central Minnesota, St. John's Abbey, which had been a real pioneer in the whole sphere of ecumenism when that was a big new thing in the mid-20th century. And they would take up um, huge theological questions that people had argued and killed each other over for centuries. But they would ask a theological question, they would pose a theological idea and, or question and say, answer the question through the story of your life. Um, you know, theologically, if you're having a religious discussion, you know, you could ask a question like, what is prayer or who is God? Uh, answer the question through the story of your life. I saw that by insisting on people using the first person, which, which was not to say that it was a completely personal story, but not trying to speak for God or for their group, but through a life story, it made that story listenable, it humanized doctrine. And I think you can, you know, you can, you can extend this logic to other spheres. It doesn't have to be about doctrine. Um, now the trick is, in that setting, you, every, you, know, you had five days, because that's really what you have to give people. So, uh, so what I try to do in my interviews is, you know, I have maybe 90 minutes with someone, and you don't even get to hear that whole 90 minutes when it becomes a radio show. But I try to, do, try to formulate some question that will take them to that place in themselves quickly enough. And so a question that I, I always ask, uh, and again, you know, there are variations on this, is uh, whoever I'm talking to, uh, whether it's a quantum physicist or a poet or... Uh, you know, whether they are deeply religious or atheists, or, I, I will ask, you know, tell me, was there, a spiritual back was there a religious or spiritual background to your childhood? And the thing is, I mean, just, just think about this. Probably the most intimidating question any of us could be asked, including me, is, tell me about your religious or spiritual life now. Right? That's okay, but, but tell me about the, re your, the religious or spiritual background of your childhood. Everyone has a story, everyone. But more importantly, the reason I ask that question, although we may leave it behind and not return to anything like it, is about where it plants people. It plants people in a place that is soft and searching, much more soft and searching than we, than we present ourselves to the world. And also, that happens to be a place where a lot of us started asking these questions that we followed that we have followed for the rest of the, our lives. So, so humanizing the people and the subject at hand. I could go on about this, but um, I do want to say, this is a little bit of a plug for my project. Some of my colleagues are here. As part of this Civil Conversations project, a lot of people have been posing precisely that question to us, saying, you know, we want to, we want to do this. And so we've been approaching this on a couple of levels, and one is 
learning about all the other projects that are out there, and there's actually a lot online in the way of resources and guides and templates. So one of the things we're doing is actually mapping some of that to put it in one place, to you know, find the best of it, and to make it available to people. We don't really have to invent the wheel here. Um, so one thing I can say is stay tuned, <laughs> and go to onbeing.org in maybe three months, because it's, it's, a, it's a perfectly legitimate question. And there, but there are some really incredible things happening. Um, so. I just wanted to ask you, um, your discussion brings to me the concept of trust. For me personally, to really do what you're trying to do is to have a sense of trust in the other person. Um, and I wanted to ask you, how do you personally deal with, do you always trust or do you just bring your trust in the conversa into the conversation because it will bring probably a better outcome for the conversation. How do you manage issues of trust in a cynical, doubting, manipulating, misinforming environment that is so prevalent in, in the world that we live in? Yeah, so the, so the question is about this issue of trust and how do you, how, how does one give oneself over to that? And, and I, you know, those dangers that you're raising are real, and that's why I, I talk about having, you have to create, there's, there has to be structure around this. I mean, you know, there can also be a great dinner party with it, but, but, <laughs> but the kinds of things where you're talking about where trust would be an issue, or where, where, where people would genuine, genuinely have reason not to feel safe, that, that has to absolutely be taken into account. Um, I also think that that, and I hate to keep coming back to the same old issues because there are other issues, but um, some of these areas like abortion or, 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 or uh, you know, differences over same-sex marriage, um, issues over identity, um, Sometimes the people who are really on the front lines of that, whose identity is being called into question, probably shouldn't be the first ones in the room in that dialogue. I think some of us who are not intimately, directly threatened have to be bridge people. You know, that, 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 that we can't ask everyone to muster that trust to be in the room, and we shouldn't. Uh, but some of us, without being directly, intimately threatened, would be able to put ourselves in that place of saying, I, you know, and this is what we're talking about, saying, I really want to understand why you care so much about this. I remember talking to Richard Mao, who was the president of Fuller Theological Seminary, which is a really uh, one of the most important evangelical institutions in the world. And you know, he's somebody who actually, on theological grounds, doesn't believe that churches should bless same-sex marriages. But he also believes that the measure of Christianity is as much about how you treat other people as what positions you take. And he also uh, is very dismayed by the vitriol. And you know what he said to me is, "I wish we could stop trading, you know, our insults and." try to understand the hopes and fears we bring to this, you know, and just imagine a reframed discussion around that. Why, why are you so, you know, what are you afraid of? Could we, could we give voice and also give voice to our hopes around it? But again, the people who are most intimately involved maybe aren't in that room, at least in the beginning. We, we can't necessarily ask them to, to be vulnerable. Hello, Krista. It's uh, uh, wonderful to uh, see you. I'm a frequent listener of uh, On Being podcasts, and uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, I remember uh, some time ago 
might have been over a year ago, I heard uh, an interview that you had with uh, Gabe Lyons and yeah. I believe it was Jim Daly, Focus on the Family. Yeah. And, um, and I thought um, it'd be great to um, perhaps get um, Gabe Lyons or one of them in conversation with Gene Robinson. And in fact, um, that's what's happening here in a couple of weeks. Gene, uh, Bishop Gene Robinson is coming to Stanford and Gabe Lyons is coming to Stanford. Hmm. And I'm wondering what advice you have for us on how to, how to manage that conversation that we're hoping to have with them. Yeah, so, so let me say, so this was one of these um, events we did, and, uh, and, and I think the most, it was surprising to many people that we had Jim Daly, who is the head of Focus on the Family. And focus on the family really stand is you know symbolic for a lot of people of of that very strident uh, and hateful face of Christianity of the last few decades. What's so interesting is he's not James Dobson, and um, and he's also deeply dismayed by that same face, which doesn't mean that he doesn't have some opinions that a lot of people would disagree with. Um, but the spotlight has never been shining on him because he, you know, he, it, it, I mean, I, 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 I hold my fellow journalist accountable for this as much as the strident voices. You know, the, it's like the, these voices throw themselves in front of microphones and cameras and that's where the microphones and cameras go. Um, again, this is somebody who holds positions that have, uh, have intensified a lot of these difficult debates, but wishes to conduct himself in a very, very different way, wishes to navigate that, and is navigating that in a different way in his life. So what could I say about, um, I just think, you know, this is so simple, but draw them out as human beings and not as representatives, including Gene Robinson. Not, not, not as the symbol he became, but as the human being he is. Um, Frances Kissling, in her adventure, uh, has come at two questions that she says when you, you know, that these are questions you need to get to the point that you can ask. And the questions would be, what do I find attractive in the position of the other? You know, is there something in, in, in them or their position or their passion that I can respect? And also to be able to honestly articulate what, what makes me uncomfortable in my own position. And those are kind of magic questions. You know, when, I, um, when we've done these civil conversations events in a few different contexts, I introduced those questions, and every, you know, the, each side answered them. You you have to build up to that place where those are the questions you can pose, and that's that's about humanizing and creating the safe space. Um, but those, I mean, those are some guides. Does that help? Do you think there's any place anymore for, in civil discussion for debate? Because that's the way we often frame these matters, and we do it in the academy uh, as well as other places. Is a well-framed debate a way to get at these issues? Or is everything you're telling us that's uh, no longer helpful? Yeah, well, you know, there's a place for debate, but everything shouldn't be debated. And, and one of the worst things that go wrong, goes wrong when you turn something into a debate is you reduce it to two sides, you know? Um, 
And when we've taken this debate model and we've applied it to these huge, complicated, intimate, civilizational issues, we, we've just, we've, we've, we've impoverished uh, right there. We've, you know, right from the outset, we've limited where we can go. And, and the problem also, you know, as we've really taken that to this macro level, Everything is defined, we, everything has two poles, right? And, the, and, and what I'm so aware of is um, most of us, on almost anything you could name, whether it's an economic issue or a moral issue, most of us are not at this pole or that pole. You know, we may be far to the right or far to the left. I'm not sure I really believe that there's such a thing as a center. I mean, everybody's somewhere to the right of center or to the left of center. But most of us stop short of those two positions. And at the very least, we know we have a few open questions. Or we have a few things we're uncomfortable with in our own position, right? But all of our, deba all of our discussions get framed in that debate, which only gives legitimacy to those extreme positions. So yeah, I think, I, I, and I, as I say, as I, as, just as we, we get to reject the framing questions and start these conversations in new places, we get to say, this is not a debate. I don't know, we can call it any number of things. We can do it any number of ways. Sometimes, actually, sometimes the, a, a most effective way to get at the Comple the real deep complexity in an issue is to interview one person who's lived a trajectory, you know, from being here to being there. It, do it also doesn't have to be multiple people. Hi. Um a uh, burning theme in your talk has been the reimagining of uh, relationships. Oh, I can't hear you. Can you? I'm sorry. Um, the reimagining of relationships is a running theme in your talk. Um, I was wondering if you could say anything about the role or purpose of um, how we might reimagine our relationship with nature in, a, in modern society, especially when um, our, our effects on have, have, have manifested in a, on a global, entire earth wide scale, you know, I uh, just wonder if you can say anything about the relationship with a non-human other, if you will. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts about that. It, it, it takes us a little bit outside this discussion, although I also think that that question is something we need to ponder together, and, and a lot of people are pondering that. Um, Again, this is really from a different corner, but uh, I feel like something um, that actually religion has contributed to is the way in the 20th century we, we got a very kind of chin-up understanding of ourselves. You know, I really feel like Descartes has a lot to answer for, I think, therefore I am. And one thing that um, 21st people, century people are doing is rediscovering their bodies. Like it sounds so simple, but we got very disembodied. Uh, and again, religion was disembodied, right? Like religion is now the, you know, became this place where you sit on an uncomfortable pew and listen to a monologue. And it used to be this cathartic, our spiritual traditions used to be these cathartic places where you were dancing and singing and laughing and crying. It was physical, and the fastest growing spiritual traditions, all of them are, are full body spirituality. Um, so I, I think a lot about that, and what I, what I also observe and hear from other people from different directions is that precisely when we get back, that getting back into your body, uh, which also means get into your, getting into your body is a messy and perfect thing, right? Um, makes you more compassionate towards all of life. It's, it's not necessarily something we think we're doing when we're becoming more 
getting into our physicality. Um, yeah, and actually, I think I think in being more embodied is is all. It, I mean, it's related to this discussion we're having in this sense that I think compassion flows from being more embodied. Just it physically flows from that. And you know, if you look at all these debates, you know, they're all chin up, right? They don't even acknowledge. They 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 cut. They even the talking heads, right? That's the language we use. They are actually cut off from the complexity of themselves, right? I mean, these same people. These you know, revelations come out about the messiness of their reality. So I actually think you can, I mean, that's how I would draw a connection. It's, you know, understanding ourselves as creatures among other creatures. And that means our relationship to each other and our relationship to the natural world. You talk... <clears throat> You talked about social healing, and I'm wondering if there's certain realms or areas that you are noticing or identifying nationwide of social healing. Are you really talking about something that happens more on that like individual or small community level? But are there like would you be able to name like this is a thing in our culture that needs to be healed? Um, that are kind of a top three yeah. to five list. Oh, there's so many things that need to be healed. I mean, um, I think a great wound that a lot of people are feeling now is, you know, income inequality, which is also a little bit, it's kind of a dry way to say it, but um, I think that this is incredibly painful for a lot of us, but, but people have no idea what to do about it, you know? So I re I'm really longing to kind of try to wrap my arms around that. Like, and, and, I, and I do believe that part of the reason it becomes such an abstraction is because we actually, we're, we're so segregated in so many ways, you know, in every aspect of our lives. Um, we don't actually have relationships with those people we'd like to help. And so, because we have no relationship, we don't know them we, we can't have a robust imagination about what we could possibly do to make a difference. Um, so that's one thing. Something else I actually would like to name is uh, this whole matter of bullying. And I, I actually want to call this out because I think something really, I think we're in one of these moments that I mentioned, like with interracial marriage, where we, we are suddenly looking at something that has just been, you know, it's been around forever, and parents and teachers would just say, you know, that's the way it is, right? It's just, that's just what happens. We have just tolerated this for generations. So, I mean, you know, there's another terrible, terrible story right today about a young girl who committed suicide. I mean, this, these are terrible things, but what I actually want to make us aware of is this is a moment of growth. And maybe the internet, maybe the fact that the cyberbullying made this so public and so global has actually contributed to this being a moment of awakening. I, I'm kind of saying I want us to like pat ourselves on the back and say, look, because this is not, I mean, clearly it's a painful, protracted process. It's not going to go away tomorrow. But suddenly it's just, it is one of these moments where we shake our heads and say, how could we have lived like that? So, you know, that is like, that's a form of social healing that's happening, but, but <clears throat> healing comes by knowing the pain. Yeah. Um, I really appreciate your words and questions, so I'm glad you talked about them tonight. And I think I remember that you have children, and I'm wondering, like, how do you teach conversation? And how do you teach, and at what age can people really converse? And yeah, just the education of conversation. Well, the, the difficult thing about raising children is um, as much as you want it to be about what you teach, 
you know, it's just, it's, it's really just about what you do, which is really hard. Uh, they're not listening to you, but they're watching you. Um, I, yeah, you know, in terms of conversation generationally, or like raising new generations, again, I just think if we start doing this, I mean, I mean, how do we learn language? How do we learn any language? We, we learn language because people talk around us. And, uh, and we, will, we, will, we will impart the art of conversation and a, a love of conversation, a respect for conversation by doing it and by showing it to kids. And, you know, honestly, I, I want to say I, I think it can, I just keep emphasizing this, it can start really simple. I, I, I think people should have dinner parties more. And, and not worry about everything being perfect. Like, this is something people just don't do in this culture. And, uh, and, and that's something that absolutely rubs off on kids if you, if you live in a home where, where people are invited over. But we stress out so many, I mean, I mean, I'm talking about myself here too. You know, you stress out so much about do you have time to prepare it and what will you cook and will the house be clean? And, and we have to understand that there's something much more important than life giving that's possible here and, and get over that. And yeah, so I mean, I, I honestly, I can't imagine something that could instill children with a better uh, regard for conversation as part of life than living in a home where people are invited over to be in conversation. I always say your children must ask the best question. That my, <laughs> my children bring me down to earth. <laughs> uh, I would tell my children that you said that, and they would roll their eyes. <laughs> um, I love the term conversational entrepreneur and your encouragements. And um, the thing that I'm struck by is beyond the words and beyond the generous questions and the honoring of the difficulty um, there's also the quality of our presence and our way of being. And yours is quite remarkable, and it comes through in the radio show, and it's quite palpable here tonight. And my question for you is, what practices do you have to bring forward this quality of presence and way of being so that, in a way, you're an invitation into that soft searching place without even the questions, just through the presence. Hmm. Um, well, I'm, I'm all, I also have my rough sides, you know. Um, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question. I This is kind of a serious answer, but I there's a sense in which I started becoming who I am now when I went through a really serious depression in my mid 30s. I mean, a lot of things obviously I was who I am, but one of the most kind of countercultural spiritual truths is this notion of, you know, strength in, in weakness, which just, it doesn't make any sense in this culture. And it hardly makes sense to me either. But the wise people I interview, and you know, to the extent that I have wisdom, it's, it is about uh, understanding that the things that go wrong for you are also part of your gift to the world. And it's about letting those things, your suffering be o an opening to the suffering of others. It's something that unites you. Um, but again, you know, I and that's why my children are so great. Like I tell people, I tell them people say <laughs> that I'm so serene, you know, they just find this uproariously funny. <laughs> and my colleagues would find it funny too. So, uh, but, but yeah, you know, I want to say, 
Yeah, presence. I mean, I do work at that. And, um, but I, people say to me, oh, you must have come from a family of great listeners. And in fact, I came from a family where no one listened and no one was present. So, you know, to the extent that I've cultivated that, it's, it's, in, it's in response to something that I realized was absent, which comes back to the point I made a minute ago, that we're only whole with our darkness and our light, both of those things together. Hi. I was struck by your comment earlier about shimmering language and the idea of expanding. I've been concerned uh, about the diminishment of English as a language and about the role of the media in targeting and focusing and getting the right word and the right phrase to literally become triggers for particular reactions. And I would like to ask you to look past the spiritual side, because I'm an atheist, to the journalist and the media specialist side and ask, how do you refocus language? How, how could journalists refocus language? What's the role of the media? How, what's your role as a media specialist in fixing this? Um, well, right, I, I, you know, journalism could be a healing art, right? It could be. Um, uh, I, I kind of have the same answer that I, the same feeling that I have about politics, which is that, you know, it is changing, it will change. There's, there are some, some pretty incredible things happening. There's something called the Solutions Journalism Network, which has started, yeah, so you've never heard of it, under the radar. Um, they're, they're, and it's started by some young people. There's a, one of them who founded that is, has a column in the New York Times called the Fixes Column. Um, we were just today at a place in the Bay Area called the Center for Investigative Reporting, and they're doing really interesting things about humanizing the news. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it is alarming, but but it's just like what's going on in Congress. It's like we can't let that define our take on reality, and and we can't wait for journalism to change to start looking for the stories we want to be reading. And yeah, and I, but it does. It I, I think it's it's redirecting our attention. And, and, you know, it's so interesting. You think about the New York Times, right? Like, I read the New York Times Sundays now. I don't read it during the rest of the week. But Sundays, I read it religiously, and I have for years. Just think about all these years that on the front page of the New York Times, it says all the news that's fit to print, and that nobody ever made fun of that. <laughs> right? Like, that until about 10 minutes ago, I mean, I don't know if this is true or not in New York, but I mean, in New York, or, you know, yeah, of course, of course. Six white guys can sit around at noon every day, sift through everything that's happening in the globe. <laughs> so, so, I mean, I think at least we're like waking up to, and, and, and that also makes it more confusing because then the picture is so huge. But yeah, I think, I, I think the question is not how can we change media, it is changing, it will change. We just have to redirect our attention and really leaven what we get out of that with other sources. So before I thank Krista, I wanna call your attention to the fact that you have another opportunity to meet with her. Tomorrow morning, there will be a breakfast at nine in the circle, the Center for Interreligious Community Learning and Experiences on the third floor of the Old Union. There are books in the lobby that Krista will be happy to sign and you can continue the conversation with the flat friend as well as the flesh and blood friend. And there also are on the tables outside flyers of upcoming events, including the one that was mentioned here, Bishop Jean Robinson in conversation 
with uh, Gabe Lyons and also in conversation with Rabbi Stephen Greenberg. So there's a flyer about that um, in the foyer. When we began this evening, a student came up to Krista and asked her what animates her. And her first two words were, I listen. And as we had the opportunity to listen to her listening, to absorb what she's learned through her listening, we've heard words that shimmer and generous questions. So I want to thank you for giving us conversation that matters. And I was thinking about the words that are part of Jewish liturgy, blessed is the one who speaks and worlds came into being. So thank you for bringing worlds into being. <laughs>